Hi everyone, today I'll be going through the solutions um, to the recent Code Forces Div 3 round. Uh, as of now, the, car the contest is still running and I'm currently 34th, but I'm expecting this to go down uh, in the future. But anyway, the main purpose of this video is to provide you of the intuition of how I came to uh, the solutions for the problems in this contest, rather than just giving you the solutions yourself. And hopefully um, the techniques that are explained and the intuition uh, may be applicable for more problems in the future. Anyway, uh, Code Forces is acting up today, so uh, hopefully not too many things mess up. Okay, problem A. Um, the key idea, the key idea of problem A is to notice that we can only ever increment, um, increment the array, and therefore, therefore the maximum. Um, therefore, um, each value. Uh, has to can only increase; it can't decrease, and that means that the final value which we set all of these elements to has to be at least the max of this array. And um, here's a here's a more um, a more formal proof, I guess, um, a more mathy proof. If we have the elements a, if we have the array a, and we want to set all these elements to m. For, and we know that m has to be at least the maximum of this array. Um, then for the first element, we'll require m minus a1 operations. For the second element, m minus a2, and then so on and so on. And therefore, um, therefore we see that the maximum number of operations, um, we see that the maximum number of operations to increase one element to m will be m minus the minimum of the array. And we can see that um, notice I've uh, noticed how I've um, split split each, and I'm just looking at each element by the by itself, even though that the operation in the question is that we're incrementing some subset. And the key idea is, let's say for example, I needed to increment the first array, first element by plus three, second one by plus four, plus two, and let's say let's take this as an example then I can clearly do this in four operations, which is the maximum number of operations for one element. Um, because I know I need at least four operations for the second element, and then out of those four operations, I'll just include the first element in three of them and the third element in two of them. And that's why the answer is just the maximum of the array minus the minimum of the array, or the range of the array. Um, my, my code is pretty simple. If if code force is gonna let me look at my code, that is, um, I'm just taking the maximum of the, of the array, and I could have just subtracted that from the minimum of the array. But in the contest, I was in a rush, so I just took the maximum number of operations for each element. Anyway, that's problem A. Okay, now for problem B, um, we have to change exactly one of these elements. Um, we have to check change exactly one of these elements. Um, into another number such that the three numbers form an arithmetic progression. Now again, I've, I've seen this type of question many times before and um, the key idea is like, let's say I have the three elements of the array and, I'm, and I know I'm going to be changing the third element, let's say. And let's say that the first two elements is 5, 10 and then we don't know what the third element is. Um, the key idea is since we know the common difference is 5, we are able to work out that the third element must be 15. And so for example, if the third element was a 5, then since 15 divided by 5 is, is, is a positive integer, which is m in the question, then we can do this by multiplying the 5 by 3. But if it was, for example, 6, since 15 is not a multiple of 6, then we can't do it. And we can brute force we can brute force um, each uh, which of the elements we're changing. So, for example, if we start with the element, if we start with the sequence A, B, and C, um, the only possible ways to modify these elements um, such that we get an arithmetic progression is uh, we can modify the list into A, B, and A plus two B. In which case, we are changing C to A plus two B. I mean, sorry, that should be 2, 2b minus a, or we can modify uh, we can modify a 
in which case we're going to get the array to 2 by b minus a. Uh, we're changing um, element a to 2 b minus a. And the final option is we're changing the middle element of the middle element, and in this case we're changing it to a, a plus c on 2, and c. So we're changing b to a plus c on 2. So all we have to do is for these three options, uh, we simply check whether the element we're trying to get um, divided by what the element was originally is a positive integer. And uh, code forces, please. Okay, code forces actually worked this time. All I'm doing is okay. So in my in my implementation, f checks whether I can whether I can change element x to element y using the operation, and that's true only if. Uh, y divided by x is a positive integer. And then I just check the possibilities here. Uh, note how instead of converting b to a plus c on 2, I'm just converting b times 2 to c plus a because the uh, quotient will be the same and that means that I don't have to work with floating point numbers, I can just work with integers. Alright, that's it for b. Um, next, we'll go with c. Okay, so looking looking at the constraints already, we can tell we want each test case to be about o n or maybe n log n or n log max a. That's sort of the complexities which we're trying to get. Okay, so the operation is we are replacing an element with its flawed half, and that means this that means that if we take a fifteen, we're always going to map it to the same element. And if we take this element, we could keep getting a chain, in which case we keep decreasing, we keep applying the operations, and we're going to keep getting chains like this. Um, what is it? We, want, we want A to become a permutation of the numbers from 1 to n. Um, the key idea is um, we can we can throw all of the elements in a max heap, I, I mean in a heap or a priority queue. So we're starting with these elements in the priority queue, um, and we keep performing this operation. Uh, we take the largest element. Let's say it's for example. Let's say the largest element is a four, and whilst um, uh, if if we can put a four is is if a four, if a four is in in the range one to n, and we haven't uh, gotten another element equal to a four, then we will stop performing operations on a four. Uh, for example, let's say let's say I have instead of this, let's say I had eight elements, a one up to a eight. And let's say um, the largest element in this array was 7. Then the key idea is that since I have a 7 and I haven't found a 7 yet, I should always take this, I should always um, leave this A4 as a 7 and not touch A4 anymore. Uh, the reason being is um, if, if another element later on happens to go to 7, then um, if another element ever got to 7, then we could just perform um, the operations on this 7 instead of our current 7. So there's never any need to preemptively uh, perform operations on the 7, because if we ever get to this 7 later on, we'll just do operations on that 7. And that means we can keep um, taking the largest element from our priority queue. If it's in the range and hasn't been taken, then we will stop there. Otherwise, we will add the flawed half back into the priority queue. And we're going to keep doing this until hopefully we've found a permutation from 1 to n. OK. So I think the code for this one is slightly more confusing. Um, so in my implementation, instead of using a priority queue, for some reason I just used a multiset. I don't know. It's the same complexity, but a worse constant. Anyway, my code is basically what I described. while while the priority queue or the multi set is not empty, I'll take the largest element from this set. Um, 
if it is in the range from 1 to n and I haven't and I haven't taken it yet and and I haven't found an element with this value yet I'll just stop I'll stop performing operations on this element and just leave it there otherwise um I'll I'll try to insert its flawed half back into the priority queue but I won't do that if the number's 1 because you can't we can't end up with a um that will guarantee that the multi set never contains numbers of zero and I won't risk uh, an infinite loop or something. And if I can successfully put all of the numbers into the, if I successfully found all of the numbers from one to n, then the answer is yes, otherwise it's no. Um, I believe this, this part is actually unnecessary. Um, I think I just did it just for safety, but it's not strictly necessary. All right, let's go with problem D now. Um, what was this problem again? Oh, okay. Okay, so this might be the first problem where I can properly explain um, a more intuitive approach because I find for the simple problems, it's usually just directly implement the problem or some greedy property or something like that. Anyway, for this problem, um, what was it? We wanted to maximize the length of the shortest pal palindrome string that, com that can be obtained. And um, so if, if you guys have been familiar with CP, whenever you hear a question like maximize the shortest possible something of a set, um, nine, like 90% of times the answer is binary search. And the criteria for binary search well, in, in, in our case is um, if, if it's possible for the max to be equal to B and A is less than B, then it is also possible um, for, for the answer to be A. Like, for example, if we can make, if we can choose every string to be a five letter palindrome, then I want to be able to guarantee that I can, um, I can also find four letter palindromes for each string and three letter palindromes and so on and so on. And this is a pretty easy proof, I think. And I think it's easiest looking at an example. That's what I did. So let's say we started with a palindrome of palindrome of length eight. Then I know that my string is going to look like C1, C2, C3, C4. But since it's palindro palindromic, um, I know this side is just going to be with the mirror of this side. And it's pretty easy to show that I can get any any number less. If it's an even number, so currently we have b equals 8. And then I want to show that for any a less than or equal to 8, um, I can turn each of the strings from an 8-letter palindrome to a 7-letter palindrome, or a 6-letter palindrome, and so on. So let's say it starts with an eight little palindrome. If I want an even number, then I could just delete this to make six, delete that to make four, delete that to make two, and that would give me all of the even palindromic lengths. And if I want an odd length, if A was odd, then I would just delete one of these C4s. That gives me a palindrome of length seven. Then I could delete the C3s, delete the C2s, and delete the C1s. And that's the construction of um, for, so if we have an arrangement uh, for each string of length 8, then for each of those strings, I can shorten that palindrome of length B into a smaller palindrome. And that means that if B is a possible candidate for the answer, then A is also a possible candidate for the answer if A is less than B. That means that I can perform binary search on the answer. Now, how, now the other part in binary search questions is how do you tell um, you need to be able to tell whether the answer can be uh, at least x, and that's the other that's the other criteria of, of binary search that you need to do. And I think it's probably easiest looking at my just looking at my code. So here in my input, um, a is acting as a frequency array. I um, a zero is the number of a's. A1 is the number of Bs, and so on, up to 20, up to 25. And when, when I do the check, I'm just inserting all of these frequencies into a multiset or priority queue. 
And the main the, the main reasoning is um, I think it's probably easier to look at some concrete example. So let's say I'm trying to figure out if um, is it is it possible for the answer to be nine, for example. And we know that we must now allocate each string uh, each string to have four pairs and one odd pair out. So each each of the palindromic strings must be in this form. And so the key idea is um, first we will try to do all of the paired elements. I if if b is odd, then for now we will just ignore the middle elements, and we will try to form the pairs for each each string. And um, how many pairs do I need to find? Well, if we, if we look at my code. Okay, my, my code is pretty messy, but basically, if you're trying to find, then each each of the strings needs to have um, that has floor b over two pairs, and then we have to times this by the number of strings because we need to find this. We need to be able to do this arrangement for each string. And that's what that was basically what my code does right here. So here Z is the number of pairs for one string, and I'm just multiplying this by K, which in my code is the number of strings. And then um, to find a pair, I will simply take um, the value which is the largest in my multi set of priority Q, and then try to take and try to form a pair out of two of those elements. So for example, if my priority if we started off with um, seven A's and like five and like five B's, my priority queue or multi set is currently looking at five and seven. And at first, I'm I'm I will just greedily try to make my pair out of the number which is greatest in this multi set. I right now I will take the seven and reduce that to five. And in reality, what what I'm doing is I'm making one of these pairs out of the a a then if I want to take another pair I might reduce this 5 to a 3 that might be taking a b b pair and so on and, and so on and so forth until I've tried to take um, each of the pairs and then next if we have b is odd then we need we need one left over we need one left over character uh, for each of the strings so in my code um, if b is, I mean, well, here I've used x instead of b. But if x is odd, uh, then for each each of the strings, I'll just try to take try to take one character. And if at any and if at any time our multi set contains a value less than zero, that means that we try to take characters that didn't exist. So the answer, so it can't be done, and otherwise it can be done. And yeah, that's basically it for problem d. Alright, now we're going to problem E. Um, so problem E, <laughs> I just did not do very well in implementation at all. But the key idea is we don't have, okay, something to observe is we don't, the question never asked us to minimize the number of segments. In fact, it tells us that we can use any number of segments. And, um, for my intuition, sometimes one of my approaches is to start with a brute force approach, or at least a semi-smart approach that has some brute force elements into it that makes the complexity bad. Um, so let's let's take this first sample case as an example. This is the string which we're trying to get, and these are the these are the strings that we know, or the numbers that we know, the digits that we know. And let's say we had um, some set of all possible substrings uh, that we already know. So out of all substrings uh, of the set of numbers that we know, which have for all segments which are length at least two, let's say we have a set with all of those elements in it. Uh, then we can run a DP, al a DP algorithm. We'll say let DP at a position be true if we, if we can um, if we can represent um, 
the substring from pause to the end of the string. For example, um, in my example, 7, 8, dp at this position would be true since we can find it, but dp of 8 is not true since there's no segments of at least 2 which can combine to make this 8. Then, um, for the dp transitions, um, if I'm at dp i, then I can loop through all possible segments which I'm remembering. I can loop through all, yeah, all possible segments of this target string, and then for each one, if I can find if I can find this string in my set, um, then my dp transition is um, it's um, dp i becomes dp i or dp um, the remaining string. Um, I'll just write it down again in case that wasn't very clear. Um, let, let's say we, z we zero index this string. And let's say um, we can find this, we know we can find the string 3, 4 um, in, in our multi set. I mean, we know that um, we can find 3, 4 in the set of values that we know. And um, remember, this is zero index. So I would say dp2 um, equals to dp2 or dp4. Because that means that if dp4 is, is true, then dp2 is true because I can represent this part um, out of segments because dp4 is true. And then for the last segment, I will, I will just take this, which I already know I know. Now, unfortunately, this is pretty bad complexity. Uh, just because of the number of the number of strings in our set is way too large. Uh, in fact, the number of strings in our set is o n by m squared, and that's because for each of the n strings, there are uh, o m squared um, substring or segments in this case. Um, so this is pretty bad complexity because actually our dp part only takes o n squared time currently um, and I think n is less than 1000 which means that that would actually be fine but unfortunately uh, that's just not quite good enough. The last part to notice is that um, we actually never want to take segments of length greater than or equal to 4. For example we even if the string 1 2 3 4 existed um, it's never we never need to take this string since we could always split this string into two separate smaller strings and in fact um, um, for all integers greater than or equal to 4 um, we can represent it out of 2's and 3's for example we could represent 6 as um, two. we could represent a segment of 6 and chop it in half and make that two segments of length 3 if we had a segment of length 7 we could chop that into two segments of length 2 and a segment of length 3 and yeah so basically um, it's we only ever need to check substrings of length 2 or 3 uh, if you want a more formal proof of this you can use either the uh, you can use mathematical induction which says that um, for any n greater than or equal to 4 it's not needed because we can always break this segment of length n into a segment of length 2 and a segment of length n minus 2. Um, and since n minus 2 is greater than or equal to 2, then this in itself is also representable by segments of length 2 and 3. In fact, that shows an even stronger result, which is that we only need to take at most one substring of length 3. Um, alternatively, we can use the chicken McNugget theorem, I think it's called, um, which states that all numbers which are greater than or equal to, all numbers which are greater than, oh, why does it do that? All numbers which are greater than 2 times 3 minus 2 minus 3, which equals to 1, are representable with only 2s and 3s. And that means that every positive integer greater than 1 is representable by only segments of length 2 and 3. So this would reduce the number of substrings in our set from o n by m squared just to o n m since each since now there's only um, o m valid substrings of length 2 and 3 for any given string and our dp um, we can still run it in 
on squared, but since we only need to ever transition from dpi to dpi plus 2 or dpi plus 3, um, the dp part is actually only on, so the total complexity is just onm. Now I'll run through the just a very quick um, implementation uh, overview. Basically, um, for the set, instead of using a set, because we need to reconstruct the answer, you can use you can use a map instead. I'm just using an, an array as a map. Um, in my in my um, in my value two D array, um, the first state or dimension represents the value uh, that I the value that the segment is. For example, if I take this segment, that's just a value of sixty. This segment has a value of twenty two. This segment has a value of six seventy eight. And the second state is whether that segment is length two or length three. And that's that's basically it. Um, this part of my code is just um, is just generating all of the substrings of length two and three, and then adding them to my map if they don't exist. Um, I don't even need this part. I don't know why I did it. And um, this part of what is this? This part of my code is the DP part. Um, I um, ti times ten plus ti plus one. That is the value of the segment of length two starting from my current position. And if that's in the set, um, then dpi um, could be, if dpi plus two is true, the dpi is true. And then we do the same for the segment of length three. And then we just did the simple reconstruction. The simple reconstruction. So current, so current represents um, the substring that we still have to process. From from the position of current onwards, um, whilst we haven't finished printing out the string, um, if the current segment of length two is representable, um, then we will output we will output um, the segment we will we'll output one of these numbers that correspond to that segment of two, and otherwise we know. Um, that this segment of three must have been representable, and then we'll just um, take the corresponding segment out of the original ones into our into our output, and that's it for problem E. Okay, next is problem F, which I actually found I found this to be the hardest problem of the set, even though it wasn't particularly hard. But anyway, okay, so the key. The key insight and potentially intuition is if you ever see something like 10 queries and end up to 1000, we know that 2 to the power of 10 is 1024, which strongly hints at some sort of bit manipulation or binary search solution, one of those two. And the main reasoning is that we only ever get 10 bits of information in total information in total. So this 10 bits of information can only encode up to 1024 possible input values. And we know that we can get we know that the test cases have up to 1000 possible input values or maybe it's 999 I can't remember. And that strongly means that for each query we make, uh, we need to halve the number of possibilities. We need to roughly halve. So if we've narrowed down the value of n to 200 possibilities, after one query, ideally we're trying to limit ourselves to 100 queries, um, because we kind of need to. <laughs> anyway, that strongly hints at either, either we have to find the value of x one bit at a time, and that would give us the 10 queries, or we can run a binary search-like algorithm and halve our search space at any time. And because x is constantly changing and additions with with random numbers, um, it doesn't preserve bit values, um, then that strongly hints at the binary search solution. Or not binary search, but a similar similar idea. So I'll just sh I'll just show you my code. Or maybe, yeah, I'll explain my code. So at the beginning, we know that x has to lie between 1 and n minus 1. 
and corresponding to our binary search solution, um, we generate mid to be the average of low and high. And what we want to do is, um, so we know that x is currently in the range low to high. And we know that currently x must either be in the range low to mid or the range mid plus one to high. And if we are able to, in one query, determine which of these two sub arrays, sub ranges x lies in, that allows us to effectively halve, halve the amount of possibilities for x. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure out whether x is in each of these categories using only one query. Okay. Um, now the question is, how can we differentiate between those queries? And um, the key, the key idea. Oh, I did not want to do that. The key idea is that uh, we have to make make it such that if x was in the left array, we're going to return. Then the query should give one value, and if x was in the other range, then the query should give a different value. And then we should be able to use the value of the query to determine which range x lies into. And let's look, let's look at a concrete example. Let's say we have low equals one and high, high equals eight right now. And let's say n is also equal to eight because this is the first query we're making. Now we need to determine whether x lies in the range one to four or the range five to eight. And in order to differentiate between these queries, um, ideally, um, we, sh we, should, we should query um, incrementing x by three because that will give us um, these following ranges for x. Because remember, um, when we put, when we query, um, when we query a value, x has to increase by that value. So we also have to increase um, the ranges accordingly that we that we know that x has to lie into. And we notice that for this for this range, the query will give us zero, and for this range, the query will give us one. Let's say that um, x happens to lie in this range, so we got a one. Now we know that low equals to eight and a high equals to 11. And we still know that n equals to eight. And we're trying to determine whether x lies in the range eight, eight to nine or the range nine, 10 to 11. And ideally, what we should do is we should make, um, we should query a value of six such that our ranges become this and then if if x was in the left half, it would return it would return one, and if x was in the right half, it would return two. And we can keep doing this, and that will keep letting us half half our search space, and therefore we will only require about log n queries, which is sufficient. And okay, so the last the last question that we need to answer is how do we know what's the optimal value to query such that we can um, such that the left half, such that the left range returns one value and the right range returns a different value. And the easy explanation is that um, we know that we know that um, for the values we know that when we take um, a range, we perform some if we take a range and then we divide it by n, uh, we know that we're going to get some value and then we're going to get some other value for the rest of the range. Um, that wasn't a great explanation, but basically what I'm trying to say is since, since we know that there's less than n possibilities, um, the value that this number is going to give will always be um, at most one less than the value that the right to most value will give. I What I'm basically trying to say is that um, when we query a value, no matter uh, if, if x was the lowest possible value and, and if x was the highest possible value, then the result of the query will only differ by at most one. And that means that we need to set our, set our increment carefully. We need to set our increment carefully such that the left array returns one value and the right array returns the other value. And the easy way to do that is to make uh, we need to make mid plus one a multiple of n. In our case, we need to make five a multiple of n. So we'll increment it by three to make five to go up to eight, 
and therefore this will return one value if queried and if x is in this range it will return a different value. So I'll go through my I'll go through my code. Um, it's pretty simple really. Um, so how how do we determine? Um, so we we're, we're basically transforming mid plus one um, into the next the next element which is next multiple of n which is greater than it. Yeah, we're trying to transform we're trying to transform mid plus one um, into a multiple of n, and the only way we can do that is to choose um, to choose the next multiple of n which is greater than five. And in that case, we can just do the floor, the floor of, no, not the floor, we want the ceiling of mid plus 1 divided by n and then times that by n again. And this is a standard well known formula, um, a standard well known formula um, to find the smallest, um, smallest multiple which is greater than a given number. And another well-known thing, so you don't have to use floating point values when you calculate ceiling, is that the ceiling of A divided by B is equal to the floor of A plus B minus 1 divided by B. And um, this means that instead of using floating point numbers, I can implement this floor using integer division. So in fact, seal mid plus 1 divided by N that's just reducing to the floor of mid plus 1 plus n subtract 1. And we're going to get this expression. And then of course the plus 1 and the minus 1 cancels out. So in fact we are just left with this expression, which is what I do here. And then since we're actually worried about the increment, we'll just subtract off mid plus 1 because that's what we started with. Then. I simply increment the ranges, um, the ranges, the possible ranges, which we know x can be in. If x gives, if x was, if our query value is the same as what the query value would have been if x was equal to low, um, then we know that x must lie in the left range, otherwise it lies in the right range. And that's basically it for f. Um, the other thing we need to worry about is the constraints. We need to make sure that the increment is always between 1 and n. Um, clearly the number of increments to get from x to the smallest multiple of x, the smallest multiple of n greater than x. If we know that x is not a multiple of, if we know that x is not a multiple of n, and then clearly this is going to re require um, between 1 and um, n and n for the increment. But if x was a multiple of n, then to get the smallest multiple of n greater than x, we would actually need to increment by n. And we're not allowed to increment by n. Uh, but the key idea is that in the previous query, since we would have chosen this um, I, I really hope I'm not making a mistake. Actually, I feel like I might be. I really hope I'm not making a mistake. Okay, I actually just thought of uh, I feel like the test case has been mean enough, but I'm pretty convinced that um, the case where x is a multiple of n is actually not possible. Um, this should have been um, n equals 9, to be honest, and then all of this would have been incremented accordingly. I'm pretty sure that it is impossible for the value of mid to ever be a multiple of n. I, I, this is definitely true for the left array since we defined this to be a multiple of n, and I'm not quite convinced about the right array, right range so far. But since, well, I'm just going to do a proof by proof by AC, guys. That's how you do stuff. Proof by AC. Um. Anyway, I'm actually running out of time, and yeah, it's probably bedtime soon for me. So I'll just.
hurry on through F to get to G, I guess. And I found G to be actually way easier than a lot of the questions that they said. I would have put this at like problem D or problem E, so I'm not quite sure why it's over here. Um, okay, so the main idea of problem E G is pretty common, and that's the question when you're trying to minimize the bitwise or of minimize the bitwise or of some value. And like most bitwise problems, the the answer is to is to find is to solve the problem one bit at a time. And actually, this is applicable any time you see. Um, I did not mean to click that again. I minimize the bitwise or problem is. Let's say we write out um, a string in binary like this, and let's say that um, get, getting a spanning tree, a spanning tree is um, is keeping the n minus one edges such that the graph remains connected. That is a spanning tree. Let's say we were able to find a spanning tree such that the bitwise or of all the edges um, was this value, and the key, and Um, the key idea is that we always pri prioritize minimizing the largest bit. For example, if we can get this largest bit, if we can set the largest bit to zero and find a valid answer, and we don't care about the, any other digits, this string will always beat this string since, uh, since the largest bit is the most important, it's the most significant bit. And that means that we will try to greedily minimize the value of the largest bit. And if we can, then we'll keep a zero there. If we can't, then we'll keep a one. And that's the crux of this. That's the crux of most bitwise or problems. Um, you just iterate through the bits from most to least significant. Uh, if we can set the bit to zero and still have a valid answer, uh, then set the bit to zero, otherwise the bit has to be one. Okay, now let's say that, now let's see, um, let's answer the question, can we, can we, let's look at just, let's just look at the largest bit for now, and we're going to ask the question, can we find a spanning tree um, such that none of the edges have this bit set because if any of the edges have this bit set then the bitwise or of the spanning tree including that edge will be one and we don't want a one we're trying to see if we can make it a zero so the easy way is just we'll just take all of the edges that don't have this bit set and then we'll see if we'll see if that subgraph is connected because if that subgraph made out of those edges is connected then we can just take a spanning tree of that subgraph and that will be a spanning tree of the original graph. Um, okay, I hope, I really hope that made sense because that's a really important idea. Um, so we'll, we'll take the edges that don't have this bit set and how I check if the graph is connected, well you can do that with a DFS, but I was lazy and I just used union find. So for each edge that doesn't have this bit set, um, then I'll try to include that edge and I'll add that edge to my disjoint set or union find data structure. And if, if in the end the graph is connected, that means that the answer is possible without this bit set. Now let's say, um, we, we went through our algorithm and we indeed found that we could leave this bit unset. Then we have to throw away all of the edges in our original graph that contain a one, since so we can't use any of those edges anymore. And then once we've thrown away all of those edges, we'll just look at the next largest bit and just perform the same algorithm. And in this way, we're gonna keep building the answer one bit at a time until we find um, the, the minimal x or. Okay, this part of my stuff is just copied from the at coder, <laughs> the at coder library because I was kind of lazy. Um, here's my here's my implementation. So edges stores a list of all of the valid edges that we're considering. Um, 
Um, I'm only iterating over the 30 greatest bits since the values can be up to only up to 10 to the 9 and that has at most 30 bits. So for each bit iterating from most significant to least significant, um, for each edge in our current value, if it doesn't have this bit set, uh, I'll merge I'll merge these two nodes or I'll add these edges to our disjoint set. And if this if the graph is connected, um, that means that I could have that means that I found an answer with this bit unset, and I have to throw or I can only I have to reduce the edges to only the edges that don't contain that don't contain this bit. And otherwise, if I do have to take this bit, then I'll just set this bit in the answer, and then I'll just output the answer. And yeah, that's basically it for problem G. I hope that problem specifically gave you some um, a technique that you can apply to more problems because a lot of bitwise problems is solving the bit one problem at a time. Um, this usually doesn't work for it usually doesn't work as well for bitwise x or but for bitwise or and bitwise and a very good strategy is trying to build the build the answer one bit at a time from most significant to least significant. Anyway I'll just quickly look at my standings just to see where I am. I wonder how much I've slipped. It's probably quite significant. Oh no it's not. Apparently I've only slipped one spot one spot to rank 35. So I guess my final rank for this contest is 35, which is pretty good. Anyway, this was a very different type of video for me, and I think I'll hopefully get better at doing these types of videos in the future. So if you want to see more videos like this, or you want me to see, um, to try doing problems or contests from a different platform, then you can just let me know in the comments or something. And don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Um, anyway, that's it. That's it for today, it's getting pretty late as you can see, and see you guys later.